And Sue, we are connected to the recording, so go ahead and get started. Okay, awesome. Thank you so much, Len. Um, welcome once again back to one of our um, Best of CTCs. I know that this was a session that lots of people wanted to attend, but it was on Friday. People were tired, and I think it was running up against the Kevin Schuma special. So uh, I know a lot of people have missed this. I think the big thing for this is getting it recorded, getting it out on the communities so you can share it amongst your organization because this is really going beyond just the, the normal workings of Datacom and really how does Datacom fit into the, the modern data environment that most of our organizations are moving towards if they haven't already moved there already. And we just wanted to share with you that Datacom does play in this very modern space of Hadoop and big data. And I'd like to welcome uh, our speaker from the CDC um, and one of our, our new Datacom ASEs, Michael Tinker, and he's going to walk through uh, how Datacom and Hadoop play in um, great harmony together. So I will let Michael take it from here. Well, thank you, Sue, and thank you, everyone, for calling in to this uh, somewhat updated replay of CTC 27 from Datacom to Hadoop, Big Data, Ideas, and Experience. Uh, I want to begin with a somewhat solemn aside. Last year, uh, Gartner officially dislodged big data from the peak of inflated expectations towards the trough of disillusionment on the hype cycle. So maybe big data's five minutes are, are almost up, but looking towards that plateau of productivity, um, this is still a very important topic, uh, at least as important as it was back in 2001 when Doug Laney wrote about the volume and velocity and variety of data that was coming in with e-commerce. So today we have more waves of data from sensor and mobile and social. And uh, the basic idea seems clear. Uh, big data is becoming uh, an essential factor of production in a lot of different industries. And data-driven decision-making in general uh, is, is a key frontier in competition and productivity. So every time you do hear the big data narrative, um, Hadoop comes up. So Hadoop is uh, a key tool that enables industries and business functions to deal with big data. Um, but generally, you hear about it kind of at a, at a high level. So our goal today is a more concrete encounter with, with Hadoop. We're going to talk about the, the basic ideas and, and, and history, but also go through a sort of role-playing exercise where we'll pretend to be data or business analysts uh, more from the distributed side who need to use uh, datacom data to help design a marketing campaign. So we will go through that demo and also look at talk in other ways that a datacom and Hadoop can cooperate. Break that out as an agenda. So again, first some, some background ideas. Uh, the history, purpose, and architecture of Hadoop, how it's still evolving, um, and then go on a bit of a tour of the Hadoop ecosystem. So these are applications built on Hadoop or for Hadoop that provide key things like uh, governance, analytics, um, data management, and then we'll go through our demo and wrap up with some more thoughts on, again, business use cases that could show up in, in your organization in the near future. So jumping in, the guiding metaphor for Hadoop is it's, a, it's an open source kernel for big data as architected on commodity hardware. The analogy is to like an operating system kernel, say the Linux kernel, where the kernel provides a, an operational framework that Linux uh, developers can can use to focus on application logic and Linux, Linux users can focus on their business apps while underneath the kernel just provides all the resource management and scheduling and security and so forth. So um, imagine we have a, a huge cluster of commodity servers and we want to, to build a big data architecture. Then Hadoop's role in that architecture is a lot like the kernel's role within the operating system. Hadoop needs to manage the cluster's compute and storage resources, a parallelized work, schedule tasks, enable security. It actually has to do all of that in a way that scales horizontally to the point of being able to say, 
cache, index, and search a copy of the Internet, which was Google's original use case. So that turns out to be pretty complicated. And uh, Google was probably the first place where people came up with a successful idea for this kind of big data kernel. In 2003 and 2004, Google engineers published several papers describing their architecture. And uh, that inspired Yahoo to launch its own open source project to rework the Yahoo web index. Um, that became, in 2008, a top-level Apache project, project. And in Hadoop 1.0, uh, it, it kind of broke down like this. The storage layer was the Hadoop distributed file system, which is a standard hierarchical file system that uh, stores files as opaque okay, blocks of data and then plus metadata. And in HDFS, as we'll see in the picture in a moment, these blocks are distributed and replicated throughout the cluster to provide fault tolerance and high availability. High availability. In Hadoop 1, the compute layer is something called MapReduce, which is a batch-only framework um, that allows you to write record every time programs that will be triggered against data sets on the cluster in a very structured way with, with automatic parallelization and um, fault coverage. So that was Hadoop 1. Hadoop 2 has, um, has brought sort of the new world. Um, you'll, you'll hear people still describe Hadoop as batch-only, but that's no longer quite true. Um, uh, with Hadoop 2.0, there's a wide range of compute frameworks that, that are available. Um, let's, let's go get some intuition from the traditional picture. So in this picture, we can see um, the sort of master-slave design of Hadoop that is very common in distributed computing. We have this uh, master node that has a name node daemon that manages uh, HDFS. And then many slave nodes, each of which will, for HDFS, be running a data node that actually stores and serves these blocks of the files in HDFS. And uh, for MapReduce, you can see a job tracker master that will accept job submissions and then split uh, those jobs up into tasks, which will be distributed among the task trackers in the cluster. And this shows us. Um, Another key architectural feature of Hadoop that allows it to scale, that is data locality. So suppose the task tracker is doing work that only needs block six. If we can put that work on the task tracker on the far right, then block six is local, and uh, we are able to move the computation to the data instead of the other way around, which turns out to be an extremely efficient architecture. Then moving on, And Hadoop 2.0, we see that this uh, MapReduce framework, which uh, not only has a very rigid sort of computing framework, but also a fixed overhead of a couple minutes for, for every job you submit, that's been kind of thrown out the window as, as far as a fundamental part of the, of the architecture. The Hadoop architecture placed it with a, um, something called YARN, yet another resource negotiator, which is just a, a completely generic uh, resource negotiation plan framework, which you can use to implement the MapReduce framework. But then there's many, many other uh, possibilities, such as uh, iterative compute frameworks or in-memory frameworks. And those are really shaping the direction of Hadoop. And if you look at the roadmap for many Hadoop projects, uh, they are, they're focused on how to take full advantage of YARN. So who is doing all of this? Well, no matter where you encounter Hadoop in the wild, it certainly uh, started with the, uh, the upstream open source project managed by the Apache Software Foundation. Um, most of the people who are allowed to commit to the Apache project are ex-Yahoo engineers who, who left to found one of these three pure play vendors, Cloudera, Fortinworks, and MapR. Uh, they all have a little bit of a different strategy. Cloudera takes kind of a freemium open source approach where its uh, base distribution is full Apache, but then it upsells proprietary uh, management and analytic products. Uh, Hortonworks is kind of taking the route that Red Hat did with Linux. So it sells, it's, everything is open source, but it sells the port subscription. And MapR is the outlier. Uh, MapR is actually rewritten HDFS as a proprietary file system, and they uh, go ahead and sell their entire distribution um, 
as, as licensed software. In addition to uh, the pure play vendors, you'll also um, see that many of the major data warehouse or DBMS players have their own sort of custom Hadoop distribution that's highly integrated with their, their flagship offerings. So, for example, DB2, um, Analytics Accelerator, has uh, IBM's Hadoop-based pure data system for analytics as an access path built-in, and so on with, with many offerings from Amazon, Microsoft, Teradata, Pivotal, Veriscore, and Trail. Okay, so let's move to this picture. Um, this is a schematic of a, of a Hadoop cluster that's running in the Datacom development environment. And two lines seem to have dropped out of the slide. But um, yeah, I think it's still clear enough. On the left side, we have uh, a MUF, 14 MUF running with server option in a ZFL part. And on the right side, we have the Hadoop cluster. So um, the cluster is running on x86 machines, actually virtual machines. And uh, the OS is Red Hat 6. And then the Hadoop distribution is Hadoop uh, 2.4 from Cloudera. So the idea is then you can kind of see the stacks here um, where Hadoop is playing a similar platform or kernel layer than the operating system is. And above that are some examples of ecosystem components that we will uh, look through and meet in a moment. Um, one point I should make is this, this is running on VMs, but if you want to do any kind of benchmarking on much less production, VMs are not the right choice. They're great for spinning up an experimental cluster, but one of the main architectural invariants for Hadoop is that almost all file system accesses should be directed to independent physical devices, and then in a VM environment where you have many hosts, competing for an oversubscribed SAN or NAS, that invariant breaks down quickly. So you do want to use this, you know, physical machines for a Hadoop cluster. Uh, there's this little guy at the bottom, uh, Ansible. It's just a, an open source uh, software configuration management tool that comes in very handy when you're, when you're setting up a Hadoop cluster. Um, you can define so-called roles that could be steps in an IT process or a configuration policy, and then automatically map subsets of your infrastructure to those roles. And that speeds things up tremendously. Um, by no means do you want to be, say, restarting the demons on, on your slave nodes by logging into everyone individually. You want a, a simple way to do that. And, and Ansible will let you do things like that, or uh, check the status of all the demons running on a node, and, and so forth. So if you are going to play around with to do, but I suggest spending a day or two um, familiarizing yourself with something like Ansible just just to uh, make life easier. There are many, many new um, Hadoop aware management tools coming out, including CA's Big Data Infrastructure Manager. Uh, but considering Hadoop alone has hundreds of configuration parameters, and for every ecosystem component you add, there's a lot more, it's always nice to just have something like this in your back pocket. Um, to take one step back and, and resituate ourselves in the big data context, right? The idea in this picture is that we can take the structured data from our data column table and um, combine that with other big data sources to, to pull these, these key value levers uh, across the organization. So, for example, um, enable transparency. Uh, if you look at, say, the um, U.S. healthcare system, Right. There's, there's many different silos, pools of data out there. There's uh, provider clinical data and cost data and payer activity from the insurance companies and R&D data from the pharmaceutical companies and uh, patient behavior and sentiment data. There's unstructured, semi-structured, structured data. If this could be synthesized and made transparent to stakeholders, you know, that would be really transformative and so on for all these other levers. Um, there's a tremendous amount of potential value when you have these kind of synergies between structured business data and uh, unstructured semi-structured data. So what were all of these characters up to? Um, continuing with our kernel analogy for Hadoop, these would be kind of the middleware or end-user applications that most people spend their time interacting with. Uh, almost everyone consumes 
um, applications serve from Linux boxes every day, but most people still don't interact with the Linux kernel that often. Similarly, most of your users, as in our demo we'll see, will be using more ecosystem components most of the time, uh, although we do with the course of the base platform. So let's go on this tour and meet some of the most popular inhabitants of the ecosystem. First, I've got Scoop. Uh, Scoop stands for SQL to Hadoop, and this um, allows bidirectional transfer between Hadoop and then uh, any JDBC compliant, which would be, for example, Datacom with server options. Uh, Hadoop is perhaps, uh, as far as Scoop, will not necessarily give you the kind of performance you would get with more specialized ETL tools but it's very nicely integrated with the entire Hadoop ecosystem and it's a good tool to play with. Another popular, um, another popular project is Flume, which is more for streaming data from many different sources with load balancing and, and routing and aggregation and so forth. A, a common application would be if you're aggregating server logs from many different uh, locations to a single, a single place for analysis. more data management and analytics. Hive, very, very popular product, project, which is uh, really the data warehouse for me. So with Hive, you can take uh, semi structure or nested data like XML and JSON, define a table-like abstraction over it, and along with, with all your other data, it gives you the ability to start doing things like creating a, a single view of the customer and, and other ideas along those lines. Um, Hive has a query language that is SQL-like, but still um, batch only, right? So no matter how small or simple a query you want to execute, Hive will still need to translate that into a series of MapReduce jobs, and uh, that's not perfect. So uh, Impala is a project started by Cloudera that is designed for bringing real-time um, SQL analytics to Hadoop. This actually started before the introduction of Yarn. So um, most of them follow is actually native C++ code that's written kind of outside the main, um, the main Hadoop Java project. But this is something that we will use in our demo um, to, to do some, some real-time analytics. Uh, HBase is a very popular NoSQL database on Hadoop. Uh, designed for billions of rows and billions of columns, which probably sounds a little weird if you're coming from a relational background because you probably wouldn't see many uh, relational schemas with millions of attributes. But um, actually, the idea of even the table in, in HBase kind of changes. HBase is really more of a, of a multi dimensional sorted map, and um, it's an interesting, interesting schema that I'll show a picture of later. Um, HBase is in heavy use at Facebook. Uh, Facebook messages are built on HBase, so we're talking about peak transaction volumes of millions per second, so hundreds of terabytes of data uh, added every month. PIG is uh, a fun little project that's sort of a procedural alternative to SQL. So SQL is a declarative data processing language, but PIG lets you define your processing pipelines kind of step by step where you explicitly say how each one should be done. And that's usually the most convenient way to think about say pre-processing or transforming data before you do store it into a warehouse. And in our demo we'll do uh, sort of the token take script where we strip quotes from a fill um, in our data set. Okay. And a few other miscellaneous things that are uh, that are common. A zookeeper is an answer to the universal problem in distributed systems of maintaining consistent state, uh, sharing resources. The, the team, uh, I think at Yahoo, um, started the Zookeeper project. And they came up with this really brilliant API design where Zookeeper exposes kind of a, a file system like hierarchy of Zenos that are really useful for implementing uh, event notification primitives or synchronization primitives. And really, Zookeeper is the single, uh, besides HDFS, probably the single most common uh, component of a Hadoop deployment. Q is a browser-based UI for Hadoop that we will be using. Um, and 
then this slide, I don't know what happens to space it, but it would be as a scheduler for you where you can you know, design a sequence of jobs to be executed and of course the sequence can change depending on the return codes of intermediate steps and it's just a your basic uh, schedule. So that was a actually a tour of just a very small part of the open source Hadoop ecosystem. Let's now take one step uh, into the adjacent world of enterprise offerings for Hadoop. Uh, Veristorm is a CA partner. Uh, they offer a, a one-stop shop for mainframe ETL with Hadoop. So um, their product is a uh, VStorm Enterprise, which they abbreviate as VSE, so I will not. And um, they uh, they really allow you to, to handle all major data sources on Z, including data comps. Some features, uh, it's very easy to browse and um, the data on the mainframe, even if you're not familiar with mainframe formats like COBOL Copybook or VSAM, uh, you're still able to just use this browser-based UI to kind of go through it, see what's there. It supports HDFS and Hive imports. Uh, it's, it's very efficient in how it uses mainframe NIST. And of course, the team has um, a lot of expertise in, in optimizing performance of mainframe offloads. So we'll also play with, with that today. Okay, so let's go ahead and jump in and look at our cluster here. So to do that, I guess I need to switch to sharing my screen. Here is Hue. Um, uh, I'm logged in as myself. Um, the Hue server in our Hadoop development cluster here. Uh, we've got some reason activity listed, shown here for me, and then uh, on the left, you know, some, some typical menu options. The, the menu up here provides us query editors for a number of things, including Hive, Impala, and, and Pig. There are data browsers where we can look at the Hive meta store, we can see what tables are in Hive, we can browse HBase, uh, and then set up scoop transfers. There is a security option, which you may have been wondering about. Uh, to turn on security in a Hadoop cluster, it's actually quite a task. You've got to, to identify, authenticate, and authorize every cluster deem an application process and user um, with Kerberos. So just Given how many different things we've already called out, Kerberizing a cluster, as you can imagine, it's a pretty delicate task. We haven't done it um, on this cluster. But we can also go on to, to browse HDFS. So HDFS, right, just the standard hierarchical file system. We've got your top-level directory here. We can browse down into um, some random folder here. This is the output of a map reduced job. And look at the output uh, would appear to be uh, the classic word count application. Uh, in this case, again, the first stanza of those on Greece should earn by Keith. Okay. And then we can also browse some jobs uh, that have been running. I've been repeatedly running the fake script for demo, as you can see. So uh, speaking of that, let's go back and set up the demo um, for our little role play as, as business analyst. I will stop sharing my screen. Okay. So the scenario is we are working for some, say, a uh, small retail chain who wants to identify high value customers who have churned, which just means that they've left for whatever reason and maybe gone over to another brand. Um, but we want to, to find out who these people are so we can both maybe do a, you know, a welcome back campaign, right? So give them a discount for a special offer or maybe just do market research to understand why, you know, what kind of people are leaving and why were they leaving. Um, I don't know. So a typical way to 
to do to set up this kind of thing to do what's called an RFM segmentation. So an RFM segmentation stands for Recency Frequency Monetary. And the basic idea is for each of these different metrics, you would break your, your customer base, say, into quartiles. Uh, perhaps um, on the recency metric, right? We might look at the first quartile and say these are con and these are customers we've seen very recently. We are safe to assume this is an ongoing relationship. Next quartile, perhaps, uh, often, you know, we've seen them recently enough that we can assume it's still an active one, but by the third quartile, things are becoming kind of an unfamiliar basis. And then the fourth quartile, we're going to say those people are current. We haven't seen them for such a long time. They're the sort of people we're interested in. Same thing for frequency, right? Uh, first quartile, customers, when they were in an active relationship with the brand, they shopped habitually. Second, typically, third, occasionally, fourth, and frequently. And we might break down the monetary segments by high value, attractive, marginal, or, or low value segments. But the idea is we're really trying to figure out who are the people in, in the segment that has high frequency, they were high value customers, but they have now churned. Those are the people we want to study. In Datacom, there, we're, we're, we have a table, uh, Aggregate Transactions, HTTPSNF, and this has some information with the last seen date for customers, the average monthly visit um, between the time they were active, and then the average spend per visit. So the table looks like this, with a, a customer ID attribute, um, which simply has a unique, a unique identifier, last seen attribute, the last day we saw them, and then the average visit when they were active, the average spin uh, while they were, were active as well. So that's Datacom. Um, if we want to, to do the RFN segmentation within Datacom SQL, it would actually require a little bit of custom coding and uh, then a bit of validation to make sure we got it right. Um, in Impala, or Hive, there are SQL functions that can, can order and analyze detail rows um, in several ways within a single query. So the details aren't, aren't crucial. This isn't an SQL tutorial by any means, but in this select uh, clause, that first statement ranks the uh, rows over an ordering by last seen. Um, and then if we divide by 2500, that's sort of splitting that rank up into four, four titles. Uh, take the filling that gives us an integer between one and four that will correspond to the quartile that each customer um, would belong to for the frequency segmentation. And same for the monetary and the recency. So this is just one very simple query that does the RFM segmentation. Um, so let's let's try to do this then. Starting with the the table and data column. That's our current situation. So first things first, um, really the first step is almost the most interesting for us as Datacom people. We're going to import uh, this table into Hadoop. So I go to the Scoop Transport Data Browser, and the idea with this is you set up source and target links. And let's manage our links. Um, I've got some links set up already, but let's go through the, the whole process. So this is going to be a link to um, a, a datacom server, so um, server attached to the MUF that has the relevant table, right? We need to use a JDBC connector, and we simply choose the fully qualified Java class name of the datacom JDBC driver. The connection string, this is just going to be the, the standard connection string that you would use for connecting to any server. Um, so in our development environment, the server we're interested in is running this connection string. And there's no security turned on for this, so I can put anything in it. Doesn't matter. All right, so we set up a link to our, our datacom server. We'll add one more link for the uh, HDFS layer on this this is your cluster we're logged into. So I just maybe call this my target HDFS. And this is going to use an HDFS connector. 
and we simply specify a, a URI for that this cluster, which happens to be there. So now we define links for both the source, datacom server, the target, Hadoop HDFS, and we can set up a new job to do a transfer. Will be the job that it goes and gets the aggregate transaction table that we're, we need to analyze. We're coming from um, my datacom server, that link we just set up, and we're going to the target HDFS for our demo. One thing about Scoop that's a little inconvenient is you already have to know the schema and the table name you're interested in importing. So we do know that, but in general, it can be a little inconvenient. For an analyst who's just trying to do some exploratory you know, analysis, this would not be ideal. These two next fields are just if you want to import a subset of the table that doesn't apply to us. The partition column um, reserves a little comment. Uh, the way Scoop works is it first collects some metadata about the table you're, you're going to um, study. It then generates a Java class that kind of models that table, compiles the class, and uh, distributes the resulting jar out to the Hadoop cluster. It then submits the MapReduce job. So, yes, so there's a two-minute overhead just, just to run a scoop job, but it submits a MapReduce job where each task in the job will go fetch a slice of the table. And uh, that slice is determined by some range predicate on a partition column. So, in our table, the customer ID column really makes the most sense to partition. And uh, that's what we'll do. The output format for the HDFS file will create, let's just, you know, do a text file, not worry about compression, and I'm going to put it um, in a directory that's in my home directory. I'll call it aggregate transaction CS2. We do a save and run. So now the job should be starting, and uh, we should see it booting. Well, let's do a little bit of a head-to-head -head now with um, with BeastStorm Enterprise. Uh, I've already gone through very similar things. You have a source browser, a target browser, right? We would set we set up the connection to the MUP in just the same way, uh, slightly different after the login. Slightly different form of panel, the same process. Give it a JDBC connection URL, but now I can just browse down right to whatever table I'm interested in. I'm interested in the sysadmin and the schema, and I actually uh, need the aggregate transaction table. So in vStorm, I can just choose to copy that somewhere. I'm going to copy it to exactly the same HDFS that we just looked at over here. Um, I can go through a few other steps if I needed to, but I don't really. I can finish. And so that happens. Uh, we're done. We just copied our ad, our aggregate transaction table into our Hadoop cluster. And we can actually go over to the file browser and see that. There it is. This atom .ag transaction that just came over with vStorm. It looks like the scoop job should be finishing up. It looks like it finished as well. So we can compare. We've got our aggregate aggregate transactions via scoop, which is, you can see for this effect, right, of splitting uh, the target table up into slices, and that each of these represents a slice of the target table. This one happened to be starting with customer ID 3001, and so forth. Uh, then the timestamps of the customer's vaccine, and then our two averages, average visits, average spin. Um, on the other hand, uh, we have the entire file right here from vStorm. One little detail, uh, these don't actually put quotes around the date, which, since we're going to use Impala, will be a mild inconvenience because Impala will then think that's a string. So this actually gives us a chance to dig into our data analyst uh, character a little deeper and use a pig job to uh, strip those quotes off the, uh, the, the build there. So let's go over to our pig query editor. And uh, I've saved the script that will do this for us. This is a pig script that will load that, that file we just created as a comma separating value file. And um, 
for each record in this quoted transaction, we'll generate another another record with the first field untouched. The second field though will have quotes replaced, and then uh, this, this third and fourth fields are untouched. That will be stored into this directory. So let's run a pick script. Now. Um, once again, pig at this point is batch only in the sense that it translates that pig script into a, into one or more map reduce jobs that it's going to submit via Uzi. Uh, a little bit of overhead for such a simple task, right? But um, if we if we imagine scaling that up to instead of 10,000 records, maybe 10 billion, then we wouldn't notice the two minutes that much and probably the overall cost of the job. Um, you can see the Uzi job has started and then that will launch the pig script. Uh, this does take a couple of minutes, so we can quickly get an even more direct um, sense of this to do cluster by maybe just logging in to the, the master node directly via FSH. A nice little thing as well. So I'm going to issue an Ansible command that goes out and asks every one of these um, nodes in the Hadoop cluster to look at all the active Java, Java processes on that um, node. This will take a moment. It's just going out and at the Linux shell issuing this JPS of Java processes and it's hiding it to something that will just uh, ignore that JPS is running. So in a moment, we should get a look for each node in our cluster, there are eight total nodes, what is happening. You can see at the very bottom, that's the master node. It has name node for HDFS, and then the yarn equivalent of the job tracker, which is the resource manager. We kind of look out here at some of these uh, slave nodes. Here's one, it's running a data node for HDFS, node manager, that's the yarn equivalent of task tracker that we saw earlier. And there's actually a, a yarn child running, which is our pig script undoubtedly is what's happening there. Um, but let's see if we're done. Yes, so I think the application just finished, so it's now telling telling us it can't find that application. And indeed, so the pig script is so let's go back to our file browser and see what happens. We put the output of the pig script in this folder and every map reduce job has this, this uh, typical form and good, our, our quotes are gone. So we now have a, a data set that we are in, in perfect position to analyze with Impala. And let's do that. We go over here to Impala. There is a CTC database right now that we like to first you know, import that aggregate transaction um, table into and then do our analysis of segmenting in the FRM uh, process. So I saved the script queries to do that, um, my query. First one, create aggregate transaction. And this is just pretty much straight SQL, right? Um, you can take uh, anybody with, with zero data column or even Hadoop knowledge and make them, and they could be somewhat productive right away here. But this is just SQL. Uh, we drop a table into the bed and then create an external table in the way we would like. So we just go ahead and execute that. Note that going out here and looking at the aggregate transactions folder to find common separated values that, that match sort of this form. So we can go look and confirm we've created the first table we need. We've got this aggregate transactions table. Um, Impala lets you browse tables and so forth. Maybe we don't want to browse, we have to wait that long. But uh, so that not look I I did not expect to see nodes there. I did not see nodes there an hour ago. 
but <laughs> let's experiment and see if that was maybe just an effect of the browser. So we could actually just, you know, select. Make uh, sure we're using the right, the right database. Okay, so yeah, that was sorry. I think the browser just misbehaved there. The table is what we expected. It's just got a little artifact of uh, no way, something I don't know. Okay, so we can now uh, now import our aggregate transactions table to install, and we can go on to create the segmentation, create the FRM segmentation. This is it's very simple, right? Simply a single select will do the segmentation for us assigns the appropriate rank um, to every attribute, flips it into quartile, and then uh, determines the appropriate recency frequency or monitoring quartile. So we'll execute that. You may have noticed these warnings we're getting that popped up there. That's simply because we're running on VM. Uh, again, there's a lot of things that won't, Hadoop does not expect to be running on VM. So we've got our FRN segmentation table, and we can finally uh, start to reach out to marketing and tell them, you know, hey, here are the people that, that you should target. Um, I'm going to select the target ID, um, and then I'm joining with this little customer info table to get a first name, a last name, and a phone. The key thing here right, is we're able to just say, you know, find the people who have turned, uh, who used to shop habitually and spend a lot of money. We need to know who those people are. And here they are. Uh, we've got Anna Harper, Jonathan Goodwin, Christopher Owen, Colin Thomas, and so on and so forth. And those are the people that marketing needs to, to look into here because they are the ones who uh, we, we'd like, we want to get those people back. Okay, so that's the demo. Wrapping up. Um, yeah, I guess we're good. Went through that demo. A few other things that, you know, could be of interest. Suppose we're a bank and we've got a bunch of customer relationship data in detail. Uh, we currently do our marketing or, or, or so on with just sort of our rest intuition. And we want to move towards best practice of using a recommendation engine to pick out customers who are statistically most likely to respond to cross-selling um, a campaign. Well, a datacom customer could create datacom tables from those VSAM data sets, right? Could set up SQL views into the data, then import into Hadoop in just the same way we did, and then use another uh, ecosystem component, Moat, to build a recommendation engine, which would then empower our sales staff to, to maximize their cross-selling efforts. Something else. Uh, log analytics have become a big thing. Um, the basic idea is if you want to kind of set up base by frequencies for events and then try to detect anomalies. That could be your operational where it's just the workload profile is changing. So you know, we might want to dig into that to get insight into what's happening. Or it could be uh, for behavioral kind of stuff, fraud detection. You know, if I've never logged on between outside the nine to five window and suddenly I'm offloading a bunch of tables at three in the morning, maybe that's, that's something to think about. So one thing we could uh, stream accounting data from up or other logs into high via Plume, um, and then use Uzi say to schedule recurring analytics that would perhaps trigger alerts or or summarize um, baseline event profiles. This one is interesting. Uh, recently, there's been a lot of regulations that increase the amount of data that people have to keep for compliance. So in banking, for example, the Volker rule, the Volker rule uh, requires most transactions to be stored for five years. Uh, in healthcare, HIPAA requires providers in some cases to be able to reproduce uh, patient data as of every single day with access. So 
I kind of suggest the data model that um, uses timestamp as, as an index. And HBase does that. So a solution here could be we, we mirror a table in HBase by streaming changes via a custom Apache storm bolt. That's just what it's called. And then we can take advantage of the fact that HBase does versioning automatically. So um, that would, would make compliance relatively easy and presumably the storage of data in a Hadoop cluster is always going to be cheaper than adding DASI. Um, that HBase data model sort of looks like this, right? So the depth dimension is, is timestamp or version. And then at each version level, we have row keys and column qualifiers that, that index the data. Um, it's a very, very different sort of world. Um, there's the only physical indexes in HBase are on the row keys. And everything is untyped by array. So there are no uh, data integrity constraints you can define from it. It's a different world, but perhaps a different talk for a different time. Uh, so what we've done today is we have hopefully given a, a concrete nuts and bolts look at Hadoop. Um, certainly a, a, a platform for, for big data analysis that has a lot of momentum. The trajectory in the future perhaps a little hard to predict. Um, but, but right now, it's safe to say that the key thing is, is building cooperative models between Hadoop and then our RDMS, RDBMS, and a traditional data warehouse. We have done some experiments. We played around with data on to Hadoop. Uh, every piece we use, um, with the exception of vStorm Enterprise, is open source. So there's a, a freely downloadable and a low barrier to entry for experimenting with this stuff. Um, production can perhaps be a different story, but but experimenting is easy. Um, definitely, there are a lot of synergies and disruptions to bring um, to the entire organization, but a big trend that's clear, um, data management roles will keep becoming more and more business strategic, and that's a good thing to, to be aware of and take advantage of as a data management professional. Um, of course, as the Duke use cases emerge, in your organization. Um, everyone at Datacom would love to be aware of that so we can support those, those applications. And uh, definitely uh, appreciate you guys tuning in today. Are there any comments or questions? For, for any questions or comments that you might have, um, go ahead and use the, the chat option. On the on the presentation. We'll go ahead and we'll we'll close out this. Presentation. I want to thank Michael for a very, very good presentation on really the, the groundwork behind Hadoop and the big data, and you've probably been hearing about this in your organization, um, and just really how, how it works and how we as datacom professionals can fit into this, this bigger picture of, of data within the organization. Um, we pull a large amount of very important business data that analytics like this are, are really key in, in customers and in companies being successful in today's marketplace. So, you know, this has been very insightful and I know it's going to be changing. We might have to have a quarterly update on how this changes because it's a very fast moving world. But I thank you for this and we'll go ahead and we'll end the call. If anyone has any questions, feel free to reach out to me. I can get the questions to Michael. Um, and I really appreciate everyone's time today. Thank you so much. <laughs>